Hello, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the last session about the power of natural history data to support drug development for PSC. Doctors Hirschfield, Levy, and Pansion explain the importance of natural history data. And now in this session, you will learn about PSC Partners Plan Natural History Study called WIN, which stands for Worldwide Integration of Natural History Databases. Dr. Veronica Miller will be moderating this session with panelists, Dr. Chris Bolas, Dr. Gideon Hirschfield, and Mary Villas. Mary will start the session soon. She's just arriving from the last session. So if you'll just hang on a minute, looks like she's here. Mary, I can turn it over to you now. Thank you, Ricky. Welcome everybody to this interactive think tank session. Um, I'm so glad that we are joined today by Drs. Hirschfield, Dr. Bolas, and Dr. Veronica Miller. Um, I introduced Dr. Hirschfield before his presentation, but I'm going to do it again because I'm not sure everybody made it there from the previous um, room that I hear closed maybe a few minutes late. So um, Dr. Hirschfield holds the inaugural autoimmune liver disease at the University of Toronto and is a professor of medicine. As a clinician scientist, he manages translational and trials-based clinical science with the goal of advancing therapies that prevent the need for transplantation for patients with inflammatory liver disease. I hope you all had a chance to attend um, and hear the presentation in the last session. And Veronica Miller uh, is going to be moderating this session. Dr. Miller is an adjunct professor at the UC Berkeley School of Public Health and is the executive director of the Forum for Collaborative Research. She is an expert in regulatory science with an interest in HIV, liver diseases, and has been a longtime advocate for the PSC moderator of the Patient Focused Drug Development Forum that PSC Partners held in 2020. I'm going to hand it over to you, Dr. Miller. Thank you so much, Mary. Um, wonderful to see you again, as well as Ricky and the whole PSC team, PSC partners team. I will start off by congratulating all of you on this amazing um, set of sessions that you have put together on Zoom. And welcome back, um, uh, Gideon Hirschfield. Um, really congratulate you on your presentation, as well as the presentations by Cynthia Livy and also uh, Syrian from from uh, from the Netherlands. I would also like to now introduce uh, one other additional panelist, and that is Dr. Chris Bolas, and um, he is the Lena Valenti Professor of Medicine and the Chief of the Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatology at the University of California Davis School of Medicine. That's just up the street from Berkeley. But nice to have you here, uh, Dr. Bolas. His extensive research is on autoimmune liver diseases, including the immunopathogenesis of PSC. He chairs the Consortium for Autoimmune Liver Disease and with institutions throughout North America. And uh, welcome uh, you to the uh, panel as well. So uh, let us begin. Um, I would do want to really emphasize that we're looking for an active discussion, and we encourage all participants of this meeting to post their questions, um, either by raising your hand or by putting them into the chat. And for patients and caregivers, any clarification questions of that you have on the presentations and sharing your needs for treatment will be very welcome. Researchers and clinicians, of course, um, we're speaking about a natural history cohort uh, and really working on a worldwide integration. And we would like to know what kinds of questions you have that you would like to have answered. And of course, to our industry colleagues, uh, remember the WIND project is being developed to support your work in drug development. And what are your needs and what would you like to see addressed as we um, engage in this discussion uh, uh, going forward now? So with that, I would like to begin with some questions that have come in from the audience uh, from the previous sec uh, sections, uh, sessions. And um, let me start up um, 
I think this is an important question for all participants. So let me start up with a question posed by Kevin. And he says, who controls access to this database? And can research groups outside the organizers obtain access? And what is the role of pharma in funding this? And I'm assuming this is referring to, to the court you're involved in, um, um, Chris, uh, Dr. Bolas. So let me put that question to you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, great to be here, everyone. Um, someone's mowing their lawn, so I hope you don't hear too much of that. Um, so specifically with, with Kaled, um, the data is collected into a secure database. Um, each site has access only to their data. Um, and uh, the data is then um, uh, aggregated um, uh, for analysis. And it's all governed by our steering committee in terms of what projects are used in, in analysis. Um, we um, have had some funding from pharma, but they don't have access to the data. We, we run analyses uh, in collaboration with them. We are currently running an observational study with funding from pharma. Um, so that's basically how ours works. The, the data we collect is de-identified. Uh, that is, doesn't contain personal identifiers. So only the site from where the patient is enrolled has the ability to go back directly to the patient. Um, this is pretty standard for all registries, um, and I assume would be the same for WIND with the same safeguards. Great. Uh, Gideon, do you have any comments to address the access issue or the funding issue? Yeah, no, I think I think the, we, we've always run very similar models that there'll be a sponsor. I think, I think that's the exact details of how the sponsorship for WIND will work will be finalized. But usually, you know, for, I'll give you an example for the ones that we always run, it's, it's been the hospital is the sponsor so they have responsibility for for the data and all the rules and the research ethics and then everything is de-anonymized and we always work hard to um share information with different partners but obviously uh, that there's a process that you there's usually an application process there's usually a review process <clears throat> there's usually a prioritization process <clears throat> and then they're, they're sharing and an industry partnership has always been incredibly valuable but industry never gets the data. They um, usually just get an output. Um, uh, the, the last sector that can sometimes be interested in data like this is regulators. They have different rules, but nevertheless, you know, any engagement with an external party, regardless of who it is, is, is judged by your institutional ethics board and your standard operating procedure. So I actually think that the sharing of data is, is pretty good, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and is pretty well <clears throat> regulated. And this kind of data is also, it's de-anonymized. It's, 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 there, there's no way to identify anyone from it. But the power of these studies is the fact that you're bringing together so many bits of mm -hmm. data from so mm -hmm. many people that you're not really focusing this research on individuals. You're focusing on populations and subpopulations. And that's really why it's so valuable um, as an effort. Right, right. No, I so agree with both of you. And also the fact that data comes from different centers also helps to reduce some of the bias, right? Because sometimes there's different treatment approaches, different, different customs. Um, and by customs, I mean the way treatment is approached in different centers. Um, and so I think across, and I'm talking about different regions in the world. So having different centers be represented adds so much value to a cohort study than it just being a single center cohort study. And, and both in terms of patient heterogeneity, but also in center uh, heterogeneity. Mary, how about the WIND project? Did you want to tell uh, this group, uh, this breakout room a little bit more about the WIND project? Yes, sure. Um, so yes, the details have not been worked out completely for the data sharing uh, for the WIND project, but uh, we definitely will, will be having an access committee that will control, you know, applications to use the data. But as I said in my presentation, it is one of our core beliefs and one of the reasons we are funding this project or the launch of this project is because we want to, to encourage the use of data as broadly as possible. With our current patient registry, 
Um, requests for data access require that the studies be, for example, IRB mm -hmm. approved. So, you know, we will want to have those safeguards in place to make sure that these are um, ethical studies and, and there will be all of the normal um, governance structures in place with an advisory committee and an access committee to um, ensure that this is being done and that there's some transparency around with requests and what is granted and what isn't. I also would like to say um, in response to the question that we are, PSC Partners is funding the launch of this natural history study with community funding. So we currently are not funding this with um, industry money, mm -hmm. um, but as I said in my presentation also, it's really important that this data be useful for industry. So we, um, we look forward to working together in the future. Great, great. Thank you. There's a couple of questions that have come in about treatment and how treatment is being recorded in these various cohorts. And I guess, you know, while we're waiting for, for these drugs that are being studied now to be approved for treatment, um, hopefully in, in some in not too long a time, uh, there are uh, treatments now like Urso and vancomycin uh, that patients are taking. How do you, and I'll ask all three of you this question, how do you see the inclusion of treatment information in as treatments are approved um, being integrated into this? Because normally when we think about a natural history study, we think about patients not on treatment. It's just what happens in the natural progression of disease. And what do you think is the value of than including patients or keeping patients in the cohort once they are on a specific treatment. Let me start with you, Dr. Bolas, and then we'll go to Dr. Hirschfield and then to Mary Diaz. Yeah, so we are collecting uh, medication use um, for the common things that PSC patients are on, urso, vancomycin, treatments of their inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, it is difficult though for us to capture all the medication use. Um, and so I think one of the limitations we have to recognize of our current way of uh, collecting data, at least for us, um, is that there may be medications or, or drugs that are taken for other conditions, you know, such as statins that have been studied in the past um, that we might miss um, by our current um, efforts. And this is where maybe some larger you know, use of electronic health records might be mm -hmm. uh, quite helpful. So far, that barrier um, in terms of collecting that information and the the accuracy of that information, I think, sometimes is is in question. But um, I think we are collecting the the more common ones and can use that as analysis to determine if there's efficacy or or it, one of the things we don't know about is is safety when we collect data this way. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so, yes, that's, that's, we are doing that currently. Um, I just want to say one quick other point is regarding medications. When patients go into a clinical trial, um, that becomes a bit of a problem for us also for doing these studies because we generally stop following them when they're in a clinical trial. Um, so some patients are excluded from natural history studies because they're on a, you know, a treatment. We don't know what that treatment is, and so we don't follow them. Great. How about you, uh, Gideon, Dr. Hirschfeld? So I think, you know, I, the term natural history can also be sort of paralleled with the term real world. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so what we're really after is real world data. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you're right, PSC doesn't have any proven therapy. So, you know, the natural history is, is, is debatable whether what you do is changing the natural history. <clears throat> but what we've done, and I'm sure will happen in wind is we just like Chris says, <clears throat> we will want to collect the common therapies that are currently used frequently. And we, because we code everything, and because the goal is to have a large cohort, over time, you start to be able to pull out groups. So, you know, you then get sub-projects which might say, okay, so there's controversy about ursodeoxycholic acid and there's controversy about vancomycin. What do we learn from our cohort about the real world use of this data and the outcomes and can I match them to patients from 25 other centers who never had those drugs? And as an analogy, we're doing a lot of this for a, 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 an analogous disease, primary biliary cholangitis, where there are a number of different therapies, licensed and unlicensed being used. And in the cohort studies that have been created, we're, you know, with time, we're able to pull out, well, let's find everyone on, you know, fibrate 
or let's find everyone on a better cholic acid and let's see what's happening to them in, in the real world so you know as mary says if you, the, the 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 hurdles the initiation so pump prime and then with pump priming more support will come i'm sure okay and then you'll you'll generate um with effort energy and persistence and some resilience as well i suspect you know long-term data um which will be real world and because it's a large enough cohort you can pick out the groups you're interested in you can you can exclude and as chris says there is a challenge of clinical trial patients as well but fortunately and unfortunately there are a relatively small number within a cohort um per individual center right uh, right the barrier to get into a clinical trial is even even higher right um, right right um for various good reasons Right. And hopefully we'll have more and more clinical trials for for patients to join in, yeah. in the near and, and ongoing it's, future. It's important. Remember, Veronica, this is a form of a clinical trial. It's just a clinical trial with no risk. Right. Okay? If you do it well, the value of these studies is as important as, you know, a traditional clinical trial. OK, so from the participant perspective, you know, you are contributing to to a clinical trial. It's just a different kind of trial you're a trialist you understand that right a different collection of data that can be used for different but often similar purposes right when we think about clinical trials we often use the term clinical trials as a short form for saying a randomized placebo control or active controlled trial uh, where people get randomized into different tre treatments often it's double blind um, etc. So we think of it as a very, uh, very much a very specific kind of medical study. But there are many types of clinical studies. In the old days, at least in my old days, we used to call these studies observational studies. And I think um, now the term real world data has sort of supplanted it, but real world data can also come from electronic health records. So that is really not a clinical study, except you extract data to then see if you can make some generalizable observations from that data. But really, I think the term observational study might actually be quite apt uh, for what you're all doing and for what WIND is doing as well, because to me, observational can include include with treatment or without treatment. So it's it's easy then to, to progress into the treatment phase. We had a question also about, would there be a specific cohort um, geared uh, just repeat PSC? But I think uh, as you have all alluded to already, when if the cohort is large enough, that would be some a subgroup you could then extract from that cohort. Um, which I think is the value of, of such a project, that if you want to look at people that got a liver transplant and, and repeat PSC after that, uh, that would be information if the cord is large enough that we could pull out. Now, we did have a question about um, wind, and this comes from Joe. So, Mary, I'll ask you this. Will the wind database replace or complement the existing PSC patient registry? It's, it's entirely different from the PSC patient registry. The mm -hmm. PSC patient registry is both a contact registry. It's a way for PSC partners to be able to directly share information with patients about study opportunities, clinical trial opportunities, survey requests, et cetera. Um, and it's all, all of the data that's collected in the PSC partners patient registry is patient reported data, aside from a confirmation of diagnosis, which is, does come from their medical records and the patient would upload that. This WIND study is collecting um, clinical data from the medical records, from the, the clinicians that, are be, that the patients are seeing. It may, we hope to include some patient reported data in the terms of patient reported outcome measures, but they're very different. So I would say they're complementary, complementary at this yes. point. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Um, we had a couple of questions about kids. The little ones. Um, how does pediatrics uh, factor into all of this? We do not have plans to include pediatrics in this uh, wind cohort. However, there is a, a pediatric natural history study that has just launched. So please um, join the PSC Partners Registry and you will be informed of it or go search clinicaltrials.gov to find out uh, where you can join that cohort. Right. And there was this question about pediatrics also specific to Khaled. 
So Chris, uh, maybe you would like to just address that quickly and we'll move yeah. on to some other questions. So, mm -hmm. so currently, uh, none of our sites, uh, at least none of the investigators uh, are in the pediatric GI uh, arena, though uh, Mark Deneau is, who is a, you know, runs the pediatric PSC consortium, very involved in the current NIH uh, natural history study in pediatrics is on our steering committee. And we've aligned our databases with the pediatric PSC consortiums and um, have been working for some time to try to figure out how we can merge these data sets as well as have a transition of pediatric patients to adult physicians and along the lines to the natural history study. So I think that's a really important uh, uh, you know, thing to think about for all of us is, you know, this transition from pediatric to adult medicine. Right, right. That is so important uh, to have that continuity. And also the, again, probably quite a bit of heterogeneity in terms of how that transition happens in terms of, of the autoimmunity and, and all of the different factors. We have another question. Um, from uh, from the audience, and that is, it came up repeatedly, so I'll, I'll kind of group them into one. How can we encourage more centers to participate in this kind of a collaboration, such as the WIND, uh, or uh, even the, the, for example, Khaled, or the work you're doing um, in, in Toronto? So one question was specifically about transplantation centers, others was about other treatment centers. Are you looking for more centers to join? And if so, what do you, what is your message? So um, from, from the Caleb point of view, um, the, the barriers to the centers joining really is that this is unfunded effort, right? So you need a dedicated, committed individual that has the resources <clears throat> to really spend the time or have others spend the time to collect the data. And so, you know, if we look at the centers we currently have, which is 20-ish, the data comes from, you know, the majority of the data comes from, you know, six or seven centers with others, partic you know, participating, providing very few patients because the, the, the demands are so, so great in their other areas of their, their, their lives. Um, so it'd be great to have more sites, but each site we bring on also requires us to manage that site and bring them up to speed and uh, other administrative hurdles. So um, if there are sites that are clearly interested and, and have the resources and interest in participating, we're always welcome to have more of them. Um, I think, I think this brings up some of the practical issues with running a natural history study that we've been you know, discussing as part of the WIND initiative is, you know, how big should it be? Should it be very broad um, or more narrow and, and deeper in terms of the data collection? You know, if we had infinite resources, we'd want the biggest study with the deepest amount of data we could collect, um, but resources are limited. So there has to be some strategization about, you know, which approach to take and where that sweet spot is in terms of number of sites and depth of, you know, information that's collected. Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. So uh, a follow-up question from Lisa, uh, I guess, is uh, the funding, um, since uh, Khaled is a labor of love <laughs> and commitment. And let me tell you, cohort studies, it does take an awful lot of love and commitment uh, to, to really do the work as well as you're doing. And so are there any uh, plans to get funding for Khaled? So we have submitted a number of grants. Uh, mm -hmm. We submitted grants twice to the FDA, which were for uh, rare disease natural history studies. Um, I think we we're one of several hundred applications for, I think, a very handful of grants. In fact, Caleb arose from a grant to the NIH for a rare disease mm -hmm. clinical research network. Um, and we've gone to industry on many occasions. We've gotten some industry support for analysis and as I mentioned, currently we have an observational study that's helping fund about six of our sites collect specific data on the itch. Um, so that's helping with some of, you know, development of biobanking and getting some very important information about how patients experience itch. Um, the NIH is not necessarily though interested in doing natural history studies. 
we've talked to them on a number of occasions for that. So um, yeah, we, we would love to have more resources to support this um, and we're working on it and we've been recently a little bit successful, but um, not enough to support the, the effort uh, that's required. And I think that's the opportunity we have with PSE partners and the WIND initiative is being able to have some resources to help with these studies that we're trying to attempt to do. Right. And there is another question uh, for you specific, well, uh, to, uh, about Kayla, it's specifically from Fred. <coughs> Excuse me. And it's about our old Kayla sites participating because there seem to be less sites on the map presented earlier versus the sites listed. <laughs> so it looks like Fred's reply, <clears throat> um, looking at our website, which I have to admit has not been updated for some time. Um, so, so that might have been, you know, there's there there's sites that are now on board that weren't on the list then, and they're probably sites that expressed interest but never, you know, were initiated. So um, we're currently, I think, at 21 active sites. Very good to know. Uh, let me throw a question maybe at all of all three of you. And Mary, I will start uh, with you. Uh, and that comes from Jude. Um, and I remember when you had when you got your PSC specific code, uh, that was such an achievement. Um, so do we know if there has been an increase in patients diagnosed with PSC with the generation of, of the, me the specific medical code? Well, I'm gonna let the specialists answer that. Um, we, we do have some access to claims data mm -hmm. um, through the CZI grant, and so we, we are exploring it, but I think both Dr. Hirschfeld and Polis would have a better answer than I. It's too early days to do that. I mean, so the code, um, the, the different versions of the code, because we've been looking at some Canadian data where mm -hmm. there's been a code used for a bit longer. Um, so I, I'd say that we can't answer that question. I'd say that there are people starting to look at it, which I think is a good thing. Um, so people are now aware there's a PSE code, but I would just uh, caution that a single PSE code will not be sufficient to identify PSE patients from these big um, coding sort of data sets. And you have to use a variety of codes to really be sure that there's a PSE patient. So we are looking actually, we've just, we've, we've started a project in Ontario where we've, we've got, we've got access to the, what's known as ISIS, which is all of the coding data in Ontario and we have an analyst going through all of those codes and you know if we use PSC and inflammatory bowel disease we can find a few thousand patients in Ontario and we'll be able to look at the time course but that, that data will continue to evolve so I'd say mm -hmm. watch this space um, to, to sort of get to closer to the to the truth as to whether it's increasing or just being better recognized or remember just better coded. Mm -hmm. Right. And Chris, um, any additional comments from you? No, I think as Gideon mentioned, it's it's still a little early. The codes, you know, and using it in large data sets, administrative data mm -hmm, needs to be mm -hmm. validated how accurate it is. So I, I think in the next few years, um, we'll, we'll have some interesting data, but uh, it's, it's a work in progress right now. Right, right. And there's another question or two that relates back to the pediatric situation, which is just so important in, in this disease area. One was about, you know, what defines pediatric versus adult? And um, I will just venture a brief answer that you can argue with is that it depends depends on where you are and is it uh, a, a federal definition or a clinic definition, etc. But then the other one was, will the database identify adults that had pediatric onset of disease? So let's go for it. Let's start with Gideon, Dr. Hirschfeld. I'll work, work backwards. Great question about, will we identify patients who had pediatric onset? So from Dilchad, so the answer is yes, we will. Um, so we're, we're going to mm -hmm. do a lot of effort to try and get all that information. It's not perfect. You know, that's even more retrospective because the, the data may not belong to that particular hospital. So it's what you've been sent. But in principle, yes, we definitely want to identify the age at onset mm -hmm. to try and learn about this, this disease um, from a sort of patient centered perspective, not, not from a hospital perspective. Right. And as regards the age, I mean, in it's usually 
it's the age that you move from pediatric clinic to adult clinic is usually our de facto. So it's 18, but that's not biology. We're well aware of that. I would just also say that in terms of running a study, a trial, there is a big difference in terms of enrolling a patient that's under 18 versus 18 and over for us. Um, if they're under 18, you have to have an assent form and, you know, it's a little bit different. Um, so just administratively is a bit of a burden for an adult center um, to, to, to do both. So if you capture a patient when they're 18, even if they were diagnosed when they're 14, it's easier than trying to register them as a 14 year old, or at least having that ability to do that. If you're only having one or two patients, you know, it's just uh, mm -hmm. difficult for us to do. Right. Now, here's a question about the validity of the data and the in in introduction of bias. This question comes from Jessica Patrick. How will you avoid tertiary referral center bias? That mm -hmm. is, patients included will be sicker than average because they're selected from a larger and more specialized site. Gideon, that's uh, Dr. Well, Hirschfield. I'll start with you. It comes to, I think you mentioned it, diversity of trial participation by site. So with the right pump priming, we're able to have um, enough sites because there's a resource to resource sites. And there will always be some bias, but the, if we collect data across North America, and then if we collaborate with Europe and we end up with as many sites as possible, we should be able to reduce the bias in terms of tertiary um, issues around round outcomes. Absolutely, we, we're aware of that, you know, severity of disease and the bias as to who you see. Um, but actually, when you dig a bit deeper, you suddenly discover that every center has some unique natures to it, mm -hmm. which is why you want to have as many as possible. So Toronto, I actually, I get referrals from primary care, secondary care, tertiary care, and, you know, fourth opinions. So we're, we're, we're very mixed. Um, and I, I think that'd be the same, in fact, for for Chris, you know, he's got actually quite a mixed referral practice, not just second and third opinions. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I think it's just about diversity of centers and the more diversity, to be more diverse, it's, it's about resourcing people's time that they can choose to take part. They'll choose to take part in something that's good um, because as, as we've talked about, the fear of missing out mm -hmm. will mean that mm -hmm. they'll be very keen to take part. So it should all work out um, in the fullness of time. Right. And any comments from you on that, Dr. Bullis? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we all have the same concern as Gideon mm -hmm. mentioned, is that we will have a bias sample. Um, because we are drawing from academic medical centers primarily, um, we currently are not a transplant center. So, you know, we, we probably have the less severe of the cases compared to some of our, you know, uh, other sites uh, that we collaborate with. And we know that there are big biases, because if you just look at the you know, transplant free survival, it's, it's much different. If you look at a transplant center, it's, you know, looks horrible. If you look at the wider population, it's not so, so bad. And there, there are, you know, increasingly, you know, better ways to have patient participation in these type, types of study virtually, um, even in clinical trials. And so I think that's something we need to keep um, in the back of our minds is mm -hmm. how can we reach out and allow others participate to participate in these natural history studies, still get the quality data we need, um, but, you know, have access, particularly, you know, patients that live in rural areas. Um, if you're not in a big city and you're not near one of these transplants or one of these centers that's interested in PSC, we're not, we're not going to know what life is like, you know, or, or what their history is like, and especially for those that have more mild disease. If you're doing well and your local physician is caring for you mm -hmm. and everything is going well, you know, you're not going to be seen. Right, 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 right. Um, so a couple of more questions on diversity. Uh, Monica is asking, so I'll, I'll do a couple of questions and then we can comment. And Mary, of course, you chime in as well whenever you, you would like to. Monica's asking, why are only North American and European centers included? And then Joanne Hatchett is asking, as you discuss diversity, do you have ideas of how to increase diversity, racial, ethnic, and undeserved, underserved, excuse me, underserved patients who may live in rural areas and more? And a while ago, there was a question about 
uh, sort of environmental toxins like living next to a power plant, etc. So thinking about diversity, including also environmental diversity. Um, what are some of your comments on that? I'd love to jump in here and just say, as, as Dr. Bolas already alluded to, I think it's a question of um, you know, the trade-off between the resources we have and the time it will take to do all of this. So we started with the WIND initiative by um, meeting with the institutions and researchers who already had existing natural history study mm -hmm. um, cohorts. And so that's been our working group and that's, that's the answer to why we're starting with North American and European centers because mm -hmm. those are the people we know can do this quicker than starting with someone who hasn't been doing it with unlimited time and unlimited money. Yeah, for sure, we would love to have, these are really important questions, of course. There are some really interesting things happening with um, the development of machine reading of medical records and other patient groups are using the, those services in their patient registries. So that is definitely something we're keeping an eye on to see if we could incorporate something like that in our patient registry. We have not yet found an affordable way to do that. Um, so it's a trade-off. Yeah. But also remember this is a platform. Mm -hmm. And it's one platform of many going on around the world. So, you know, and the world of PSC is not that big in terms of the people who are interested in it. So, you know, even within Europe, there are different efforts, you know, within each different center, the different collaborations. So if you get this right, you get a good platform in the middle, which works for certain questions. But for example, we've collaborated with a Japanese group. So we do have some data from Japan. OK, um, it's a different set of data. They record things in different ways. But, mm -hmm. you know, we've got a, we've got a link. And as as the platform becomes solid and you've got the resource and the infrastructure, and you've done it for your primary goals, it's easier then to reach out and say, well, you know, we've, we've identified this. Are there other centers? Do you have any data from Tokyo? Do you have any data from South America? You know, and so again, just think of this as a catalyst. Right. I guess that's why you chose the word wind. You know, uh, you know there's a bit of momentum here. Okay. Um, and and um, success begets more success. I was going to say that exactly. You just stole my words. Right. Absolutely. Success begets success. And Dr. Bolas? Uh, yeah, I'll just touch on what Joanne had the, the question about in terms of uh, increasing diversity. So um, I, I think that this, this is a really hard issue, not just in PSC, but in every forms of, you know, Mm -hmm. medicine in terms of overcoming barriers. Uh, and there are so many and, and addressing them is quite difficult. And, you know, technology does, isn't always the answer. I think we've, we've tried that. It does help in some ways reaching out to certain rural areas that may not have physical access, but there's, of course, the digital divide. There's all sorts of barriers, culturally, economic. It really is, is, is quite difficult to overcome. Mm -hmm. um, so it does require sustained effort. It generally requires people of those communities to be involved in the effort to do outreach uh, and help patients in those groups um, access the research or, or medical care. So uh, these, are, these are not simple issues to overcome, but the more people that are involved, the more centers that are involved, the better we'll do. And I think that's one of the things that we've seen and have focused on in Kalid is really trying to make sure we have populations that you know, have higher percentage of African Americans, Detroit, Pennsylvania, uh, you know, so that we do get representation um, of all, all groups within our country that are affected by this disease. Right, right. And for the environmental um, toxins, for example, you will have the geography, you will have the cities, I assume, and counties yeah. uh, that people live in. Yeah. And so, again, with um, appropriate size of the cohort, that those kinds of environmental factors could yeah. maybe also become a sub-study. There were a couple of questions about MRE, MRI, and FibroScan. 
and uh, how all of that relates to, well, first of all, how will that information be integrated into the studies? And second, um, how does that relate to, to what we call laboratory biomarkers? In fact, in the biomarker world, um, in, in a, a fiber scan or an MRI is a biomarker. Um, it's a finding that um, is not how a patient feels, functions, or survives directly. But we often think of biomarkers as something we measure from the blood or the urine. Um, but how, how do you see this integration? Because it won't be just one biomarker that will be needed, right? You will need to better diagnose, to better select patients, and to better inter interpret and understand the treatment effect. So how does all of that fit together? Let's start with you, Dr. Hirschfeld. Uh, all very important, and we'll capture what we can. So I think fiber scan will be easy to capture. Mm -hmm. I think qualitative MRI imaging will be easy to capture, as in the reports. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think other things will be add-on projects as, as, as we progress and as technology becomes more widely available. So if there is MRE data, then that will also be captured. <clears throat> but you know, specific quantitative and uh, MRI technology probably won't be captured immediately. The idea is though, that when you create this platform that you can then go back um, and ask people to, to update. Um, so, you know, and I can see a question from Kevin about, you know, mm -hmm. reliability of fiber scan. So absolutely, when we capture fiber scan in our real world data, we try and capture the time, the interquartile range, <clears throat> the probe and the result. But you're right, that's not perfect. And the regulators may come back to you and say, that's why this is real world, not clinical trial. Precisely because you can't tell me how you um, manage the variability. So I think as Mary pointed out, that there is a middle ground always. You know, there is an unlimited resource. If there was unlimited resource, we know exactly what we would capture. Um, and Chris knows exactly which centers he'd go to and the resource would flow, but that, that, isn't, that isn't actually the reality. So our challenge is not having the idea or knowing what we'd like to capture. Our challenge is making sure we capture as much as possible with the resource that we have. Um, so we, you know, we guide and advise PSC partners how to steward their, their, their choice of where their dollars go. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and that's actually been, always been the challenge that we know the questions, uh, we know what we'd like. So you know, I think these are all valid um, and I can tell you that capturing fiber scan data has been very successful in PBC. It's been pretty successful in PSC and other cohorts. And we look and our data looks like, you know, just the qualitative capturing that we're doing is providing informative information. So whilst we, we fully recognize there's a, there, there are some wrinkles to the way the data is captured, for each biomarker, as you said, you can still get quite a lot of information from it. Again, echoing what you said at the beginning, the more data, the better, because that's how you then wrinkle out some of the noise. Right. Um, instead of just having 10 items of data, if you have 5,000, you know, your statisticians who are the smartest in the group can, you know, find a pathway to sort of smooth things out. So would love to collect everything. We won't. Will we collect as much as possible? We will. So let me then throw in a question here. Um, uh, to you, uh, Dr. Bolas, well, to all of you, really, but once we have this quantity of data, like, let's say, a bunch, a whole bunch, as my grandson would say, who's visiting right now, lots and lots of uh, biomarker, like laboratory data, we have lots and lots of different kinds of images, some actual images, some maybe documents. Do you think... Uh, where the field is ready now for some machine learning and some, some artificial intelligence application to this data as it, should we be planning for that now? Um, <laughs> You're I, in California, I am by no right? means an, an expert on machine learning or artificial intelligence. Um, what I do understand about it is it's, it's good at predicting or developing models, right, of what, a previous, you know, what the data you feed into it is. Mm -hmm. um, and then how reliable it is prediction of a future cohort. And it's, since we don't understand how it's making those predictions, it's hard to really glean a lot of knowledge from it. So it's been used already with the Presto model for, mm -hmm. you know, PSC. And I suspect it's another approach that could be used. 
Um, but I think there will be some limitations to, to how it's used. And, and, and I think where it's most valuable is probably where there's very large data. And that may be more in the MRI range, the imaging range, where you could mm -hmm. feed it lots of data from an image and then get quantitative data instead of qualitative data out right. of it. That's where I would see it. But in terms of developing predictive models that might help develop some something that could be used to get approval for a drug and make us feel confident that a drug is effective, I'm, I'm a little skeptical at this point. But like I said, I'm not an expert by any means in the field, so. Right, there definitely is a real push to making that whole black box much more transparent and understandable to, yeah. to everyone that uses it. Did you and have any thoughts on that? Yeah, let's be realistic here. I mean, so you can use AI to give you some ideas or often the ideas were the ones you knew, um, but you know, you, then translating into practice is the next step. So I think it's a great opportunity. I think they are using it on mega data sets to, to, to identify trends, but changing clinician practice and embedding the technology into a clinic so that AI is actually used is a little bit away still, um, because th that's a pretty big change in how we all think. So, you know, I, I think it, at the moment it's going to be really good for giving us new ideas and new things to look for, new, new avenues for research which we can then go and say, okay, well, look, AI identified that the combination of serum rhubarb and plasma banana with times by 10 is a predictor. You can then go down deep dive into your individual cohorts and see whether you can extend that observation. So I think at this stage, it will be a great way to identify questions that we couldn't think of. Right. Um, That's yeah. Hypothesis generating. Hypothesis question. generating. So, but it, it, it will get there. But talking about bananas, uh, <laughs> there was a question here about dietary habits uh, influencing a fiber scan. So how many bananas should you eat before a fiber scan, Chris? Zero. <laughs> yeah, don't eat before your fiber scan anything. So you are correct that diet. So if you eat something that increases blood flow to the liver and that increases the stiffness of the liver, so you need to fast before your fiber scan. That, and that is one of the potential reasons that fiber scan may be inaccurate as well as in PSC, mm -hmm. if there's an obstruction and you know, if you had a bile duct, it gets obstructed, your disease is a little bit worse at that time, it'll cause the liver to get stiffer, but it doesn't mean that your disease has advanced. Right, right, one the, right. One of, one of the... Of, I was just Sorry, gonna the, comment, I said there was a question about MRE and there is mm -hmm. you know, less variability with MRE. It's just not as available out there. Um, and so it's, you know, it is another piece of data but just not as feasible for most mm -hmm. centers. Mm -hmm. So here we are. I believe this is our time to close up. Is that right, uh, Ruthann? Mary, do you know? I, I think we were supposed to finish at 2.33. I, I don't want to make, you know, keep you late for other sessions. So I think uh, that's about as much time as we have. And I uh, want to thank uh, this, uh, both of you, uh, Dr. Hirschfield and Dr. Bolas, and of course, our very own, very special Mary Diaz from Toronto for this session. And just a reminder to attend the next session to hear about the PSC Partners Prompt Program. Um, and we had um, also a very good uh, video presentation on patient reported outcome measures. And it's all about the patient. It's all, uh, you know, we need to be so patient centric in our research. So with that, I will close this session and thank you all for your active participation. I've really enjoyed this discussion. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much.